Good morning and welcome to Nordea's first quarter 2024 results presentation. I'm Ilkka Ottola, the Head of Investor Relations. With me here in Helsinki today are President and Chief Executive Officer Frank Van Jensen and Group CFO Ian Smith. We'll start off with a presentation by Frank, followed by a Q&A session. In order to ask questions, please dial into the teleconference. But with that, let's get started. Over to you, Frank. Today we have published our results for the first quarter of 2024. We began the year strongly, continuing our good momentum, supported by a competitive offering and our advisors' proactive approach towards customers. Return on equity reached 18.1%, which is our highest first quarter return on equity since 2007. So a good start, despite the generally subdued economic environment and the ongoing high uncertainty in the world today. <clears throat> At Nodea, we have a strong business franchise with a resilient and well-diversified business model. So we are well equipped to navigate uncertainty and serve our customers. And as our first quarter results demonstrate, we continue to be one of the best performing universal banks in Europe. Some highlights for the quarter. Total income was up 6% year on year, driven by net interest income growth of 11%. Net fee and commission income was stable. Net Insurance result was up 33%, while net fair value result was lower compared with a very strong Q1 last year. Operating profit increased by 19% year on year. Our good return on equity of 18.1% compared with a return on equity of 17.1% in the same quarter a year ago. The lending markets were slow. Still, we performed well, with our mortgage lending volumes stable and corporate lending volumes up 2% year on year. Our assessment is that we have defended our market shares during the period. Retail deposits were up 1% year on year, while corporate deposits decreased by 6%. Asset under management were higher for the quarter, increasing by 8% on last year. We saw a solid net flow in our Nordic channels. Cost development follows our plan, excluding regulatory fees. Our cost to income ratio was stable at 40%. Credit quality remained strong. Our loan losses were once again modest at 33 million euros or four basis points for the quarter. We have kept our management judgment buffer unchanged in local currencies at 505 million euros. Underlying capital generation remained strong and our CT1 ratio stood at 17.2% for the first quarter. That's an overview of the quarter. Let's now take a closer look at the numbers starting with the income lines. Net interest income increased by 11% year-on-year, driven by higher net interest margins and higher corporate lending volumes and offset partly by our deposit hedging. Activity in the Nordic housing markets remained slow in the first quarter. Demand for new loan promises was lower than a year ago. Still, we continue to be active in all markets maintaining our first quarter mortgage lending volumes at a similar level as a year ago, and also maintaining our market shares with continued share gains in Sweden. Household lending margins were lower year on year, but we saw some improvement during the quarter. The corporate markets stayed slow, but still we increased lending volumes by 2% year on year. Net fee and, co and commission income was stable year on year. Our savings fee income increased, driven by higher assets on the management. The AOM increase, uh, increase was primarily driven by market performance with a mixed picture in net flows. 
While we continue to generate solid Nordic net flows of 1.1 billion euros in the quarter, our international channels, wholesale distribution in particular, continued to experience lower gross sales and consequently we had a net negative flow. Our outflows in the international channels halved in the quarter and we are working hard to get them back to growth, which we expect will take some time. Over the past four quarters, our Nordic channels, which correspond to 86% of our total AUM, have generated net inflows of 6.8 billion euros. Income from payment and card fees also grew in the quarter. Brokerage and advisory fee income was lower year on year. Our lending fee income was up slightly year on year, while fee paid in relation to significant uh, risk transfers we made to improve capital efficiency were higher. Net fair value returned to a solid level in the first quarter after a somewhat softer fourth quarter. Customer risk management activity remained at a good level, with FX and rate products most in demand. This part of the net fair value is a core part of our customer relationships and it has been relatively stable over recent quarters. Market making was 35 million euros for the quarter, down from a very strong comparative 97 million euros. Treasury was positive, supported by improved valuations. We continue to manage our costs with strict discipline. Costs for the first quarter continue to develop in line with our plan, increasing by 5% year on year, excluding regulatory fees. The main, driver, the main drivers were salary inflation and the investments we are making as we build for the future. For Nodair, being a strong bank means being a resilient bank, and we are always working to strengthen, building on our robust financial position and developing every aspect of our operations. We are strengthening our technology foundation. We are investing in our digital offering to ensure we can offer our customers the very best services and experiences. And we are working to protect our customers and societies from financial crime. These are investments that help Nodair uh, to help make Nodair a safe and strong bank for our stakeholders. During a quarter, we also had costs related to the integration of the businesses we have acquired in Norway, that is, the personal banking and private uh, banking business from Danske Bank, and Nodea Pension, the life and pension business in Denmark. Regulatory fees in the first quarter were substantially lower as the Eurozone's single resolution fund fees are zero this year, and so our total cost decreased by 9%. Credit quality remains strong, and we continue to benefit from our well-diversified loan portfolio in the more challenging economic environment. Net loan losses and similar net result for Q1 was 33 million euros or four basis points. This was lower than the fourth quarter last year and, uh, and also below the long-term average. A good position to be in given the uncertain economic environment and the rather dramatic increase in interest rates. During the quarter, we made only a small number of new individual provisions, mainly in the area of construction and consumer-related industries. Generally speaking, our customers continue to be resilient. But naturally, we are monitoring developments closely. We have a management adjustment buffer of 505 million euros to cover additional potential losses, and this is unchanged in local currencies from previous quarters. Capital generation and our capital position continue to be strong. At the end of the quarter, our CT1 ratio was 17.2%. This is 5.1 percentage points above the current regulatory requirement and demonstrates our strong capacity to support our customers, shareholders, and society. In March, our AGM approved 
the dividend for 2023, resulting in a total dividend pay payment of 3.2 billion euros to all 590,000 shareholders, including 570,000 private individuals and many pension funds in the Nordics. That's 3.2 billion euros that goes to further supporting Nordic growth broadly, or economic growth broadly in the Nordic societies. We also completed our latest share buyback program of 1 billion euros. Our capital policy and our ambition to deliver market-leading shareholder returns remain unchanged. We continue to generate capital and expect to be in a position to provide an update on our capital plans, including buybacks later this year, after the ECB approves our new capital models for retail exposures. Our four business areas all did well in Q1. In personal banking, we had good income growth and performed well in lending and deposits. Customers increased their savings and investment activity. During the quarter, we saw a 25% year-on-year increase in the number of customers beginning a new savings plan using our digital savings assistant. We also strengthened our offering by introducing new deposit products in Finland, in Norway and in Sweden. Deposit volumes increased by 2% year-on-year. On the lending side, we continued to experience slow Nordic housing markets. Mortgage volumes were stable while customer demand for new loan promises was slightly lower than in the same quarter last year. In Sweden, we further grew our share. The number of private app users and logins both increased by 7% year on year in the quarter. Total income for the quarter was up 8%, driven by 9% higher NII. Return on allocated equity was 20%, compared with 19% in the same quarter last year. And the cost to income ratio improved to 47% from 48%. In business banking, we created solid income growth and grew our lending despite the slowing corporate market. Lending volumes were up 1% in local currencies year on year, driven by Norway and Sweden. Deposit volumes increased by 1% and we continued to see migration from transaction deposits to fixed-term deposit products, which offer customers higher rates. During the quarter, we were able to reduce waiting times when customers contacted us by more than 20% year on year. One of the reasons for that is our digital investments. We have gradually made more of our services available to our customers on a self-service basis so that they can manage their finances quickly and easily with a few clicks. For example, in Sweden, customers can now use Nordea Business, our corporate app, to apply for a green business loan. During the quarter, we also rolled out Nordea Business in Norway, and the app is now available in all our markets, all part of our plan to deliver the same recognized experience to our customers across the Nordics. Our net loan losses were at a moderate level of 20 million euros, or nine basis points. Total income for the first quarter increased by 7% year on year, the increase was driven primarily by net interest income growth, supported by deposit margins and volume growth. Return on allocated equity was 18%, unchanged from a year ago, while the cost to income ratio improved to 40% from 42%. In large corporates and institutions, we continued to actively support our largest Nordic customers with their investment plans. We were very active on the advisory side and therefore had a solid quarter in what remained a challenging environment. The macroeconomic uncertainty has, has led to reduced levels of corporate activity, and this was still the case in the early part of the quarter. However, we did see a pickup in activity in March with large business encouraged by the latest inflation data. Our lending volumes for the quarter were broadly unchanged in local currencies. 
Deposit volumes were down 13% year on year, though quarter on quarter, we continued to see more stability. Debt capital markets activity also picked up in the quarter, and we arranged more than 200 transactions. As a result, our fee income reached its highest level for any first quarter in the past five years. In equity capital markets and mergers and acquisitions, we continue to see improved sentiment and momentum in the market, with deal activity slowly improving, including in private equity. We continue to work with our customers to support them in meeting their climate requirements and we remain number one in the Nordics for corporate sustainable bonds. I was pleased to see Nordea recognized for its sustainability leadership, winning awards for being best in the world for sustainability-linked bonds and best in Western Europe for sustainability-linked loans. The credit quality of our LCNI loan uh, book remains strong. Net loan losses and similar net result amounted to net reversals of 12 million euros. Total income for the quarter was down 5% year on year. The decrease was driven by a drop in net fair value income relative to the, the, the elevated levels we saw in the first quarter a year ago. Net interest income increased 7% year on year, while net fee and commission income was up 5%, driven by capital market transactions. Return on allocated equity was 19%, down 2 percentage points on the same quarter last year. The cost to income ratio was 35% compared with 34% last year. In asset and wealth management, we also had a solid quarter with strong momentum in our private banking business, a key focus in our savings strategy. Total income was up 2%, driven by higher net insurance result and higher net interest income from improved deposit margins. The cost to income ratio remained stable despite cost inflation and integration costs related to the acquisition of Danske Bank's Norwegian private banking business. Total assets under management increased by 8% year on year to a total of 391 billion euros, driven by appreciating stock markets and positive flows in Nordic channels. In private banking, we grew the number of customers in Norway and in Sweden by more than 1,100 during the quarter. And total income was up 9% year on year. Customer activity remained high and net flows were positive by 300 million euros despite seasonal headwinds. In international channels, and wholesale distribution in particular, we continued to see outflows driven by the same dynamics as seen over the past year. The high interest rate environment continues to drive rotation from certain funds into money market instruments and deposits. While we are working to address this, we expect to see the same trend continue in the near term. In life and pension, we have continued to develop our offering and strengthened our position. Supported by recent acquisitions, net flows remain strong. Our market shares in Norwegian and Swedish pension transfer markets reach their highest level to date. Gross written premiums in the quarter amounted to 3.1 billion euros, up from 2.3 billion a year ago. While most of that increase was driven by the Nordea pension acquisition in Denmark, we have also driven organic growth in Sweden and Norway. Return on allocated equity was 36% compared with 37% a year earlier. The cost to income ratio was stable at 42%. To sum up, we have started the year well with high quality income growth and strong profitability. We remain committed to delivering market-leading performance. We will do that by continuing to develop the customer experience, by driving focused and profitable growth, by staying firm on cost management, and by continuing to improve capital efficiency. 
Beyond that, we continue to take steps to ensure we are a strong, predictable and resilient bank for our customers, shareholders and society. Resilience is more than having a strong balance sheet and capital position. It's about having the right business model. It's also about investing in the many other elements too, being it digital capabilities, cybersecurity, financial crime prevention, or tackling climate change. Risk, risk come from many areas, and banks need to be strong in every area. You can therefore expect that we will continue to prioritize resilience as we deliver on our business plan. Looking ahead, we expect to achieve a return on equity above 15 percent for the full year 2024, and with our 18.1 percent return on equity for the first quarter, we are off to a good start. We also target similarly strong profitability in 2025 with return on equity above 15%. Our ambition is unchanged to be the preferred partner for customers in a need of a broad range of financial services. Thank you. Operator, we're now ready for questions. If you wish to ask a question, please dial pound key 5 on your telephone keypad to enter the queue. If you wish to withdraw your question, please dial pound key 6 on your telephone keypad. The next question comes from Andreas Hackinson from SEB. Please go ahead. And good morning, everyone. First question comes to the buyback discussion. Um, you delayed it, of course, but could you tell us a little bit why did you delay it? Are you uncertain about the outcome, the impact we discussed about the IRB overall? And since it's delayed, do you think you have time to really do uh, – a full what we would have expected buyback late in the year, and if not, should we just move that into next year? So it's not money lost; it's just moved in time. That's my first question. Morning, Andreas. Um, nice to hear you. This is a timing thing. We, we don't yet have a, a decision from the ECB on our models. Um, the ECB continues to negotiate with negotiate. the Nordic regulators. They want to reach a common understanding and. You know, there are some, some uh, complex um, uh, matters uh, being discussed in terms of how the models work, etc. So we think it's sensible to wait for that to conclude. Um, and as we have said, um, then we'll update the market on, on capital return plans. So, and your, your key question really is on timing. And we, we don't know because the, um, uh, those, those discussions between the ECB and the Norwegian FSA and the other parties continue. So uh, we're being patient and prudent. Um, and as I say, this is timing. But you, you know Nordea. We're strong capital generation. We're among the best payout, uh, dividend payouts in the sector. We were the first out of the blocks on buybacks and, and continue to do so. And we don't sit on excess capital. So uh, I'd, ask, you know, um, I'd ask you to be patient as, as we are and um, we'll wait to get the decision from the ECB. So, so you think, actually, from a modelling point of view, the prudent thing to do, see, if I assumed $500 million for this year, if I would, for any reason, believe that that's not going to happen this year, I should just move it into next year, and then I get a bigger buyback next year. That's the way to look at it. I, I think that's probably a, a reasonable basis. The only thing I can't tell you is, is you know, um, uh, the, the, the timing of the decision. That's fine. Then second question comes on the NII. I must say I was positively surprised that the hedge kicked in more and earlier than I would have expected. So could you tell us a little bit, because I remember, Ian, at the time of the Q4 numbers, I think you said that you expect the NII to be relatively stable during the first rate cuts, uh, given that the last rate hikes didn't really have a big positive impact. So going from here, coming into the quarters where we're most likely going to have rate cuts, 
how do you think underlying is going to develop and how do you think the hedge is going to play out? So should we actually see the NI continue to grow quarter by quarter from here? So we, we saw a small, you know, I guess positive, uh, if, we, if we can say that the, a lower headwind, if you like, from, uh, from, from the deposit hedge in Q1. And, and there are two things, I guess, where, where the, the hedge gives us um, benefits. One is when rates start to move, and that hasn't happened yet. But also what we're seeing is the benefit of some of the more expensive hedges that were, that were, were, were purchased at low rates starting to roll off and be replaced with um, uh, higher-yielding hedges. So there's a bit of that dynamic at play in Q1. And, of course, the, the, the real support you get from the hedge is what happens when we see rates come down. In terms of the outlook for NII, um, you know, as we said in our Q4 results, our expectation for 2024 is that we would see resilient net interest income. Um, and I think that certainly played out in Q1. And I, I, I think we will see that resilience um, continue until we start to see perhaps the, the rate cycle uh, begin to move. And you know, we're not making any guesses as to when that will be. But we also said back at Q4, as you point out, that uh, the, the, the later rate increases uh, didn't have a significant impact on our net interest margin. Uh, and I think it's reasonable at this stage, subject to whatever the competition do, that those initial rate cuts will also be uh, relatively margin insensitive compared to uh, what we we'll might see later in the cycle. Thanks very much. That's all my questions. Thank you. The next question comes from Marcus Sandgren from Kepler Cherv Raw. Please go ahead. There, um, I was just thinking the credit losses, what's the reasoning behind keeping the management buffer unchanged given the low loss level and uh, what's your uh, and lower expectations for the future? How long can you keep the uh, uh, the buffer unchanged? Hi, it's Frank. Thank you for the question. Um, no, it's a very relevant question. So uh, it, we are Q1 was very strong, so you, see, uh, you look at the quality, stage two is a little bit higher, but actually we are, we are not seeing a lot of, of bankruptcies within the portfolio, and, uh, and I think we are, the team, the team and the customers are, are, are managing it very well. So four basis points is a result, and, and due to that there is no reason for uh, reversing the, the uh, management buffer right now. And... Um, <clears throat> Although we have been wrong, uh, I think most of us are, are uh, assessing sort of like how how much credit losses the crisis, let's call it the crisis, would uh, sort of like tr uh, lead to. Uh, um, I, I, I think it will just be prudent to, to keep it for now, and that is what we have been doing. That said, of course, we cannot keep it forever. So uh, either we will release it to... To, uh, to meet the unexpected losses, or uh, we, <coughs> we will <coughs> basically just release it over time as, 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 as we don't use it. Uh, and, but ju just now, no need to do anything as the underlying was very, very strong. And there's no signs actually here uh, just now that sort of like things will uh, deteriorate significantly uh, um, right now. Okay, thanks. Very clear. And then may I just ask also on, on what's your feeling on the competitive landscape now when, I mean, we're at the peak at, of, of rates and it should go down. Do you expect the competition to pick up in, in terms of, uh, for volumes, basically? I, I saw Avanza lower their mortgage rates already on a product that is already cheap. So what's your thinking there? Thanks. That depends a little bit about which country we are talking about, but I would say in <coughs> In general, so the mechanics and the dynamics in the markets are the same as we have seen so many times before in crisis, right? So uh, when when the when the market activity is slow and even in some countries declining, then some actors are tend to forget that this is a long game, and uh, it doesn't really help you to do business that are not profitable or too risky, but um, but um, yeah, it very much appears for the same actors, and, and, and also it's a little bit about size. 
of the the actor. And uh, and right now we do see irrational behavior out there. Uh, it is just to stay firm and uh, and be super proactive towards the right deals, the right customers, um, and then avoid the, the the sort of like the do- the bad deals uh, when it comes to risk and to pricing. And that is exactly what we do. But there are some that uh, either feel desperate or at least are behaving in a very odd way, uh, given sort of like the pricing and the risk. You see that in all the countries, and you clearly see this in Sweden as, as well. Um, I think, as usual, when we start to see a relief, so uh, on the interest rates, the first rate uh, reduction has happened. We have central bank heads. We have sort of like chief economist, we have banks, we have politicians that start to communicate that rates are starting to come down, inflation have peaked, then people will start to believe in the future again. You will slowly start to build up uh, uh, confidence and that usually will come with some uh, more activity, more dreams, more belief in the future and then investment capacity, uh, as it is, investment capacity is quite good at the moment, it's just that people sit on the money it will uh, translate into more business. And then usually the margins will reach uh, more uh, sort of like um, suitable or numbers or more appropriate numbers, I would say. Uh, so so we are very positive. And in between, we are we're cherry picking, having high activity and impacting what we can. Okay, great. Thanks. The next question comes from Shrey Srivastava from City. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for taking my questions. You've obviously highlighted the new deposit products you've introduced during the quarter in Finland, Norway and Sweden, and the fact that you continue to see migration from transaction to savings. I mean, given you've obviously got a unique vantage point across the Nordics, uh, could you highlight the difference in these deposit mix shift trends that you're seeing by country, if that's all right? And my second question would be on significant risk transfers. If this obviously had an impact on your provisions, your fee and commission income, and obviously capital. Is this something you foresee yourself doing at this run rate for the foreseeable future? And thus, should we extrapolate the impact going forward to the next quarters? Or is this more opportunistic and we shouldn't be extrapolating it? Thanks very much. Morning, Trey. So we, we we tend not to talk about in, in detail about the, the sort of split between countries. Um, generally speaking, our household deposits are about 40% transaction accounts, 60% uh, uh, savings or remunerated deposits. Um, over the last 12 months, that's probably shifted by 8 or 9 percentage points um, between the two. Uh, but the rate of, of mixed change has slowed over the last few months. So, um, And that's what you'd expect to see. Uh, we've often talked about customers you know, getting used to the new environment. Um, so I think that, um, that, that that mix is probably going to be reasonably stable um, from, from now on. Um, and I think the, the encouraging thing is that customers really like our new products and, and we, we find ourselves in um, many markets, uh, you know, doing well and capturing uh, market share. So um, yeah, I, th- I think that feels reasonably stable in terms of the shape of the deposit book. On SRTs, the reason we highlighted it this time is, um, you know, it has had more of an impact on uh, both those lines you highlight. Um, the, the guarantee fee coming through the uh, commission income line and then the benefit coming through on, on loan losses. We, we use these um, probably more actively than our, our Nordic peers. We think it's uh, uh, often a good way to deliver capital efficiency. I, 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 and, and not in any way opportunistic. So we'll continue to do um, a, 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 a couple each year. Um, and uh, it's a, a reasonable contribution, I think, to our capital efficiency. So no volatility. We just wanted to highlight the impact uh, this time around because it was a bit different. That's very clear. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Magnus Anderson from ABGSC. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, uh, good morning. First, uh, 
just the unknown capital there to to conclude uh, follow up to Andreas's question. So, as I uh, as I read you, nothing has changed with regards to your estimated 10 billion uh, risk weighted asset impact from from the retail models, the 6 billion estimated impact from Basel IV, uh, or the 17 to 18 billion estimated capital repatriation between 22 and 25. Is that correct? So all of those things are, are central to our capital plans. Um, we, 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 we don't see any changes at this, at this stage. Yeah, and the corporate models still your best guess is that you would get that approval in 26. Or... I, I think that's the earliest we can expect, yes. Yeah, okay, and no uh, quantification or anything like that there? Uh, no, no, not at, at this point. I think um, we're, we're working with the ECB on um, uh, you know, what, what we're seeing with those models and what their requirements might be. And when we get a better sense, um, we'll update you guys, Max. Okay, thank you. Then, secondly, on costs, uh, two things there. First of all, uh, in the Q4 report or, or at the telephone conference, you gave kind of a soft cost guidance for 24 or flat or slightly up, including restructuring costs for the Norwegian uh, operations, whether that's still valid. That's number one. And number two, you also said that you would respond with cost initiatives if the income environment would turn tougher, uh, which it could, of course, uh, with rates going down. So I was just wondering, in what business areas or functions would we see such uh, initiatives? Hi, Manu, this is Frank. Uh, I would say right now we are in line with our plan. So, uh, so uh, nothing has changed to what we said in Q4 on cost. Uh, we're steering with a firm hand. Uh, we are continuing, as you know, to invest uh, heavily within uh, technology, uh, digital uh, uh, offering, cyber, uh, ESG, uh, financial crime prevention, and et cetera. And we have actually added uh, um, um, more to sort of like the, uh, this investment basket this year than last year. So it's very significant. And although these uh, extra investments, we are uh, still in line with our plan. What I'm trying to say is that we have actually already taken extra sort of like uh, actions to ensure that we follow our plan. If we should end up in a situation where we would need to do even uh, more on the cost side, um, there, there, is a, there are a number of areas uh, where we could uh, reduce our spending. Uh, it, there's no free lunches, so if we would do it, and then we would, of course, first of all, try to ensure that it would not sort of like hurt our franchise. Secondly, we would be quite confident or we, we need to be quite uh, confident that we would not see a pickup in growth in societies within short. And the reason for that is uh, starting to reduce sales capacity and whatnot is, is, of course, very easily to do. But it comes with a consequent short midterm as well. Uh, but but you can rest assured if that happens that we we need to to work even harder with the cost we will do it and um, and we have a number of initiatives uh, lined up uh, without going into more details. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Sophie Petersons from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, here is Sophie from uh, JP Morgan. So, um, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, just to go back to on on the share buyback, I understand that it's a timing, but could you maybe just elaborate why it is a timing issue? Because you got it for IRB models to be around 10 billion increase in risk credit assets which should be more than manageable. So, so why do you have to wait for the ECB and, and the local FSAs to agree when you got to shoot, I assume, already have quite a good understanding of where the risk credit asset inflation from IRB models will come? And then my second question would be on, on the fees. They were a bit softer than expected and it seems that it's quite broad-based uh, driven by brokerage advisory 
and lending fees. How should we think about the, the kind of fee outlook from here? Thank you. Should, would you take yeah. our capital first? Yeah. yeah. Morning, Sophie. Um, so look, I've, we're, we're, we have a really good working relationship with the ECB on buybacks. And we're simply respectful of um, how that works. And so uh, in circumstances where, you know, they're still working up to their decision um, uh, and dealing with a number of moving parts, we, we just think that it's sensible to, to, to pause. Um, it, it changes nothing in terms of our, uh, our, our attitude to capital return. It changes nothing in terms of our long-term outlook, as we confirmed um, this is just being respectful of uh, the relationship with our regulator, and I think our shareholders understand that. All right, Ian, thank you so much. And when it comes to the, uh, the NCI, I, I don't agree with you. It's not a soft one. It's a solid one. And uh, actually, it's, it's, it's performing on all lines. Uh, there are, I guess, two things that we should be aware of, uh, which uh, is probably also the reason for why you are asking. So... Uh, First of all, we have 11 million, as Ian said, uh, uh, securitization cost included in, in the lending fee. Um, and, uh, and that means that sort of like uh, there is a, a small drag on that. Uh, it's, it's, it's for good reasons, right? But, but to understand there is no underlying business momentum that has changed in any way. So that's one. The other one that is uh, we have a... I think an okay uh, inflow uh, now on our Nordic channels, uh, uh, in our Nordic channels, which is 86% of asset under management, <clears throat> and confidence in societies are starting to building up, meaning that we get more requests on, on, uh, 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 on uh, advice on, on investments and whatnot. And the inflow is um, 1.1 billion euro, I think it was, in our, inter in our Nordic channels in, in Q1. So all good, and it's building. Uh, um, we struggle with our uh, wholesale, meaning our international channel. Uh, international channel is then 14% of our asset under management, so, so a small one. But, um, but especially wholesale, meaning uh, other banks uh, of the world are working with their clients and handing their savings and... Uh, to a large extent, they are offering deposits and, and other similar uh, products, while our, um, uh, you can say, low risk, low short duration uh, fixed income products are not as popular as it have been before. And then ESG, of course, uh, has also gotten a little bit of cold hand right now. So we have less gross sales um, at the moment than we have had before, and that leads to a net outflow on that channel, which is uh, quite significant. So that is why we are having a little lower speed than we would usually have had on assets on the management, and that, of course, translates into a small headwind on the total fee on savings and investments. But all in all, uh, we will solve it, and uh, it is picking up. Okay, that's uh, clear. And maybe just regarding the securitizations, I mean, now we have seen two quarters of uh, securitizations. How, how should we think about the capacity to do more securitizations going forward? And is the end game here really what Ian also mentioned uh, previously around the, the capital efficiency? Uh, but Kind of maybe if you could uh, just comment around the, the securitization or the scope for um, more securitization. Yeah, so the, the, there are certain areas of our book where, you know, the market and the counterparties we deal with have a more sanguine view of, um, you know, the, the, the risk associated with it than maybe comes from the regulatory capital requirements. And so where there are, you know, spots like that for us to exploit, um, then then we'll do so. But w we just see this um, as, you know, one of the tools in our armory. So um, I, I, I can't see us um, uh, ramping up uh, in this space. It'll be, uh, you know, at the edges in certain portfolios. You know, a good example of, of where we, you know, think we see opportunities is um, shipping, where because of regulatory risk weight flaws, we have 
uh, floor on, on shipping. We don't expect that to be there forever. But uh, when, uh, w while we have that in place and, the, as I say, the, the, the market um, uh, understands that the risk is pretty low, we can get some good pricing on protection there. So um, I, I think it's one where we, we pick our spots. Uh, it'll be a small part of our portfolio, but an important um, element in just, just trimming our, our capital consumption. So um, we're not ramping up. But, it, but it's uh, basically driven by uh, capital. Uh, it, where we have an opportunity to um, uh, take advantage of a difference in view between a regulatory capital requirement that, in our opinion, is much higher than we need, and that opinion shared by the market, then we can do good business. Okay, great. That's very clear. Thank you. The next question comes from Nicholas McBeath from DNB. Please go ahead. Thank you. So first, a question on uh, return on equity. So given the 18% ROE in the quarter and your expectation of uh, NII resilience for 2024, do you see potential to uh, substantially um, come in above the 15% ROE level suggested in your uh, unchanged ROE outlook, or are there any meaningful headwinds that you anticipate to weigh on the return equity in the remaining three quarters for this year? Hi, it's Frank. Uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> I think we feel comfortable with where we are uh, and um, delivering on our 24 uh, uh, return target uh, or outlook, uh, meaning better, better than 15%. Um, and there's nothing that really points to us not having sort of like a a strong, strong, um, strong uh, sort of like trajectory uh, for the for the the coming period either. But of course, um, whether it's sort of like uh, 15.1, whether it's 16, whether it's 17, or whatever it might end up with when we close the books for the year, that's difficult to say and too early to say, of course. But uh, a good start to the year and. Um, and uh, as I said, we expect to, to continue with good steam ahead. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and then second question on uh, the resolution fund free, which we saw a quite big decline here in Q1 um, this year versus last year. So I was just wondering whether you could comment on the resolution fund fee outlook uh, for 2025. Yeah, happy to do that, Nicholas. So, um, yeah, we, we still – our resolution fee in the Eurozone from the Single Resolution Board was zero this year, and um, as, as announced by the SRB, because their fund had reached its target um, and we had relatively stable levels of covered deposits. Um, and uh, uh, I, I guess, you know, one can take a view on whether, whether that um, situation will persist next year. Um, I, 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 so they'll come back to the banks for more money if the fund is depleted in any way or if they see deposits go up. I, I suspect that's probably less likely. Um, but we still have um, a, a resolution fee that's payable in uh, some of our Nordic home markets, which is why there is still uh, uh, some resolution fund fees in that line because um, they continue to, to, to build um, the uh, uh, the funds in in those territories. So I, I think it's um, it, it, it's it's difficult to imagine uh, a, a change in circumstances for the SRB next year, but we we have to be in the hands of the regulators there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. The next question comes from Gulnara Saikilova from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. This is Gulnara from Morgan Stanley. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I have on NII, please. So on page 18 of the presentation, we can see that you have reduced the volume of your hedge in the first quarter versus the fourth quarter. And why is that? And would you consider any further changes to the volume of the hedge going forward? 
And another question on NAI. So you currently guide for your NAI outlook, and you mentioned that uh, you expect it to remain resilient for this year. Uh, looking across your key Nordic markets, in which geographies do you think uh, you would expect the most resilience to come from, and which markets do you think will have a weaker positioning when it comes to the NAI? Thank you. Morning, Gulnara. Uh, nice to speak to you. So we, we have a, a, a base volume of, of hedging um, uh, that, that we always maintain, which is important for our risk management purposes. But sometimes we see that the um, you know, market pricing um, is either favorable or unfavorable. And so we will you know, vary around that, that base volume. Um, and what we did, what we saw in Q3 and Q4 last year was um, what we thought was, was you know, good pricing to add to the volume of the hedge. Uh, when we moved, you know, when rate expectations in the market changed um, you know, mid to late December, uh, into Q1, pricing was less attractive, so we didn't add to the volumes, and um, you know some of the hedging ran off. So this is a, a, a bit of oscillation around the, the the top end of hedge volumes, and um, it's the only area where we might actually sort of look at rates in the market and um, uh, trim or add as necessary. But the bulk of the hedge uh, is an interest uh, rate risk management instrument. And uh, you know, driven by our our models in that regard, in terms of customer behaviour and other things, and is 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 pretty solid. Um, in terms of resilience, well, I guess it it depends on where we start to see rates move. I mean, what we saw in Q1 was a good performance in Norway because uh, it was the first quarter for quite some time that we we didn't see any rate changes. Um, and that means we didn't have to manage uh, grace periods on repricing assets and those kinds of things. And so a stronger performance from, from Norway and, um, you, you know, I think uh, uh, the, the rate cycle settling down there is helpful. In, in other markets, it, it will depend on, um, uh, you know, where rates change. So Denmark and, and the Eurozone for, uh, and in Finland and then in, in Sweden. So um, I, I think net net across the group um as i say we expect to see that resilience um and i think you'll then get a more nuanced picture as we go further into the rate reduction cycle and just to add one thing there we, all, we should also remember that the mortgage margins are very low at the moment uh, which usually happens uh, uh, in such a situation and uh, uh, usually the mortgage margins will when rate starts to decline and activity starts to revert, they will come up to more, uh, you can say, decent levels than, than today. Thank you. The next question comes from Namita Samtani from Barclays. Please go ahead. Morning. Um, if I look at your corporate lending book, to me it's very focused in the low probability of default buckets, i.e. to my mind it's a lot of investment grade lending, which brings me to my question that if system loan growth were to come back, would you be willing to go up the risk curve and be more aggressive on lending and even potentially at the expense of a bigger buyback? Um, and secondly, could you just help me understand the loan demand trends you're currently seeing in Norway, both on the household and corporate side? Thanks very much. Thanks, sir. Let me take this one. So uh, our risk appetite, um, I would not exclude that it, not by design, can change slightly during a crisis or during a period at least that's sort of like where is a, there is a lot of uncertainty as right now but that is not intended so our appetite on and our sort of like definition of what is a credit that fits into Nodir and what is not a credit that, fit, that doesn't fit into or what is a credit that doesn't fit into Nodir is the same so the problem by assessing a credit uh, sort of like right now uh, pro uh, that, 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 that that is how how clear are we on believing in the stickiness of the or the strength of the future cash flow? 
That's very often the problem. And of course, with all the uncertainty right now, it is more tricky. But the risk appetite for Dodair, so which type of customers are we chasing and where do we believe that we spend our shareholders' money, that's unchanged. So you would not see any change in sort of like aggression when it comes to chasing higher risks and for the price that we will uh, um, get more credit losses over time uh, and have a bigger uh, sort of like capital drag. That, that's not the intention. But would there be anything that we could do even better right now? Uh, there will always be things that we can do better, but I cannot point to any precise things right or detailed things right now. On the uh, Norway question um, about activ activity, as I understood it, um, uh, uh, I would say that the corporate the corporate landscape is quite active. Uh, we are, I think, we are doing very well. I'm very pleased with the uh, progress that we are making, um, and um, and it is actually uh, it is. Uh, sort of like a lending growth is built on, on several pillars. It's, uh, it's very limited commercial real estate to what it was before. Now it's very broad-based in all sort of uh, industries and um, it is looking good, I would say. Uh, the retail or the mortgage lending is a little bit more slow, um, but, um, but actually it's still active. And uh, I think I sense a, a good sort of like uh, believe in the future. And that leads to the Norwegian market being okay, I would say, given the circumstances that we have right now. Probably the best or most active market right now of the Nordics when it comes to mortgages. Thanks very much. The next question comes from Ricardo Rovere from Media Banker. Please go ahead. Thanks uh, for taking my question. Good morning, everybody. Uh, three, if I may. The first one is on your 2025 target. When you think about the situation, the macro situation, when you conceive those targets, and you look at what's happening, how the situation is shaping today. What do you, what do you think is, uh, uh, is, the, is there any big difference from what you were thinking, you know, months, uh, months ago? Is it shaping better or worse? Uh, also, you know, qualitative comments could be could be helpful for us. The second question I had is, uh, yeah, you mentioned that earlier in the call that you expect, uh, if rates do go down, at least at the beginning, uh, you expect no major impact on NII because the recent hikes did not provide any major positive contribution. Now, if you had to throw a ballpark, what would be the magnitude of rate cuts, you know, need to be to see impact on NII and negative impact to, let's say, surpass the benefit from the deposits edging from 35 billion deposits, so more or less. And the third question I have is just a clarification. It's not clear to me whether the active RWA management can be something that can smoothen materially the impact from uh, the review of the models. So, so is it something that can let's say, cancel half of the 10 billion uh, that you expect to see uh, from model review, or, or, or I'm just getting it completely wrong. Thanks. Oh. All right, thank you. Should I take the first one? Um, so uh, the question about the uh, uh, sort of like the confidence or at least the, uh, the view on the 20 or 25 target. I would say nothing has changed in our view. Uh, we were very confident in our capabilities to deliver uh, on our target, uh, robot target of 25 being better, greater than 15%. And, um, and we are still, uh, and, and nothing has changed negatively to that. On the contrary, I should say. Um, um, of course, there are changes when it comes to expectations, when it comes to sort of like interest rate curve and whatnot. And actually, we have 
basically stop focusing and sort of like taking that into consideration. What we have looked very carefully into, what is the resilience of Nodea? What is sort of like, uh, what is the, what, what, what are we able to deliver and how, how adverse should sort of like the environment be before we should be starting to come into risk? And, uh, there's nothing right now that from a sort of like macroeconomic perspective points to anything that should not, uh, that, that, yeah, or any scenario that where we should not be able to deliver. That, that, that is what we are seeing right now. I think my biggest concern uh, that, that is um, that is the uh, that is the geopolitical situation, and the reason for that is it's something that we are not in control of, and we don't actually know what can happen. Uh, we do know there is a lot of tension, and it seems that it's building. We do also know that sort of like an incident somewhere can lead to a big consequence somewhere else. And uh, and how that will then potentially translate into impacting, uh, you know, economic environment, economic outlook, uh, sort of like inflation, thereby growth. It's completely impossible to uh, assess at the moment. So what we are doing is we do look at the fundamentals. We do look at sort of like the outlook. We stress tested and we are conf- uh, comfortable and uh, quite confident in our capability to deliver on our our targets. Else we would not. Uh, else we would not uh, have them. So that's one. The other one is that we continue to strengthen the resilience of Nordea. We are super resilient and we are we are built on a very well diversified portfolio in our opinion and uh, and I think we have created a level now where we are very profitable we have a low volatility and we have a low risk uh, that said um, resilience is something that you have to work with all the time and that's why we invest so heavily in in uh, non-financial risk areas, in uh, technology foundation, in digital capabilities and so, and we will keep investing because we think it's important. Resilience and building resilience is the best answer to meet uncertainty. So I think that's the best answer I can give you for now. Over to you, Ian, please. Yeah, morning, Ricardo, and thanks for those thoughtful questions. I mean, I think when when we think about resilience in 24, um, there's there's a caveat there, but we, we're still pretty confident. And that caveat is what happens on the competitive front. But you know, I, I think it's reasonable if we look at the if we look at how net interest margin built um, over the hiking cycle. Um, the, the the first the, the last sort of three or four twenty five basis points uh, rises were less. Um, impactful on net interest margin than what happened before that, and so, you know, in answer to your question, I think that's that's probably the, the the uh, the, the horizon that we see. But uh, you know, how we perform will depend on how uh, soon and how often rates are reduced, and then secondly, um, how uh, the the uh, other banks in our market uh, respond also. Um, but I hope that helps. And then the active RWA management. Um, I, I think that uh, the, 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 there are two things that help uh, us offset the, the, the rear in inflation that we'll see from retail models. The, the first is just strong capital generation, um, and, and we expect that to continue. And then there is a there is a, a helpful contribution from SRTs and, and active capital management, um, and we saw. Uh, for example, a 20 basis points contribution from capital management in uh, the first quarter of this year. That's a combination of, um, you know, uh, um, uh, agreeing on treatment of certain items with the ECB, uh, you know, just good housekeeping, and, and then also um, the impact of SRT securitizations. Uh, it, it, we, we are unlikely to do enough of those to wholly offset uh, the impact of retail models, but um, it's definitely something we're actively working on, and it makes a really helpful contribution. So, yeah, so, so w- when you say offset, what you have in mind is partial offset, not full offset. Partial. Partial, okay. And, and that's because, as, as I said with, with earlier questions, you know, this is, it's a useful tool, 
but it, but it's not something that that we we use um, uh, wholesale across the board. It, it's where it makes sense. Very clear, very helpful. Thanks. The next question comes from Hugh Moorhead from Berenberg. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks very much for taking my question. Sorry, just one more on the buyback around the timing. Um, is it fair to assume you'll wait for ECB approval of the retail models before you then make a buyback, app, buyback application with them? Uh, and also, does your preference, or sorry, your I guess soft guidance for smaller, more frequent buybacks that you gave at Q4 remain, or is that possibly more of a 2025 story? Um, and finally, uh, can you just confirm that the timing of the Dansk acquisition won't affect uh, the sort of potential buyback timeline? Thank you. Morning, Hugh. Uh, so taking your last question first, um, you know, Danska uh, is, is still expected to uh, complete um, towards the end of this year. It's been part of our plans for quite some time, so uh, you know, no no impact on the capital plan. Um, uh, the smaller, more frequent um, uh, uh, statement that we made uh, back at the Q4 results, it, it, it reflects the, um, uh, I, I guess the the. The, the different place we find ourselves in now, which is where we've dealt with um, the obvious excess capital, and now it's about you know just um, continuing to generate capital, thinking about how we can deploy that in our business, and to the extent we 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 think um, uh, it's better to do so, we return to we'll return it to shareholders. So that that smaller, more frequent, that's I think part of our um, uh, part of our DNA from from for, for the foreseeable future. And then in terms of, you know, a very detailed question on the buyback application, I said before that, um, you know, what, the reason why we're waiting is because we're, um, you know, just cognizant of maintaining a good relationship with ECB. So um, uh, we'll wait for the decision um, and then we will uh, proceed with, with capital return actions and plans thereafter. Great. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Jacob Cruz from Autonomous Research. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Just two quick clarifications. Um, so first on the resolution fund fees and the reg uh, regulatory fees really, which was 63 million in this quarter. If I, if I think about the full year, is, is that kind of 18 billion regulatory uh, fee above resolution fund fees or 45? Uh, what I should think about as the run rate for the next three quarters, um, and then secondly, on the on the MAI, you talk about resilience, you talk about the resilience, the initial rate cuts, um, and and the hedge is coming in. Um, so when you say remain resilient, does that mean uh, flat to up, or is that being too specific about it? If we talk about the sort of next one, two, three quarters, thank you. So uh, morning, Jakob. Um, so the 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 I guess we 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 book resolution fund fees in the first quarter. Um, the the, uh, the recurring item that you get is the Swedish uh, risk tax, um, which is about eight million a quarter um, or thereabouts. So um, that's the I, I guess what we see for the rest of the year. So twenty a quarter almost. Uh, okay, clar uh, cl uh, clarify that for Jakob offline, but. Yep. Um, uh, I may have misspoken. Okay, and then on resilience of NII, um, the I mean, what we talked about back at Q4 was that you know on on um, assumptions that that were in the market on timing and extent of rate cuts plus other things, impact of the deposit hedge, etc., um, is that we would expect 2024 to come in higher than 23, um, and I think that's that's pretty clear. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think that's a, a good, resilient performance. Okay. Thank you. Clarify on the, on the, on the bank tax. So 18 million in Q1, that's the number. And I think we're ready for the last question now. Operator.
The next question comes from Harry Sivakumaran from KBW. Please go ahead. Hi there. Uh, just had a question on slide 22 on the uh, real estate management. You can see that the stage two is ticked up slightly, but also that the impaired loans have decreased. Uh, are those recoveries, and at the same time, I can see that uh, your coverage ratio is ticked up there. So just, just any comments on that. And then on uh, LTNI uh, in, in Denmark, you can see quite strong growth this quarter. Uh, it looks like it's plus 11 percent Q on Q. Just what's driving that? Is that kind of you know regular um, you know working capital, or is that kind of more capex than from your customers? Yeah. Um, I think I could take the last uh, question first, and Ian, you can take the remaining part. So LCNI in Denmark is just having a good uh, speed at the moment. Many activities are going on, many deals are happening. Uh, so I don't think we can, at least not, not to my nuggets, we cannot point to anything specific then that we need to talk to with the team. But, but in general, I would say that uh, it is a business with uh, high energy and a lot of activity uh, going on. Ian, um, the, yeah, uh, the answer then, questions, please. Yeah, so Harry, on the um, uh, the increase in, in stage two is a, a, a mixed picture. There's um, uh, some uh, real estate positions, there's some construction and related and some consumer industry um, uh, sectors that are affected in there. Um, some of it is, is because we're seeing, um, uh, you know, those customers enter into high risk. Um, but also, some of it is is quite technical in that um, you know, where, where you see a, uh, a, a, a a downgrade from you know uh, very strong to strong in terms of the credit rating, um, that that also uh, is a trigger for moving as an ECB trigger for moving into stage two. So um, it affects us. Um, it, it won't affect um, non ECB regulated banks in that regard. And I think in terms of you know what we're seeing moving into um, stage two, it's probably half and half between, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 I guess a, a worsening of outlook for certain customers and those automatic triggers. And then in terms of the the improvements that you note, um, that is about a, it's a combination of actual recoveries and uh, customers with with improved uh, credit outlook. So a mixture of the two, and I think is um, uh, I think it's positive. Uh, in terms of just being able to uh, see uh, some of those credits strengthen or us work out of situations with a favourable outcome. Thanks. Okay, we have uh, reached the end of the uh, session. So uh, thank you so much for part your participation and uh, a lot of good questions. And uh, feel always free, as you know, to come back with uh, any question that you want to discuss. We are here for you. So uh, thank you so much and uh, have a good day.